Now let's get started. And before I turn to you, Gary, I figured I would just do a really quick summary of the case and what um, and briefly what we learned on Thursday. So for those of you who aren't familiar about the Fulton case, in March 2018, the city of Philadelphia learned that two of the agencies it contracted with to provide foster care services to children in the city based on um, that two of those agencies would not, based on the religious objection, accept same-sex couples as foster parents. The city informed those two agencies that it would no longer refer children to their care unless they agreed to comply with the non-discrimination requirements that are part of all foster care agency contracts. One of the agencies agreed to do so, and the other, Catholic Social Services, or CSS, sued the city, claiming that having to comply with this non-discrimination requirement as it pertains to prospective same-sex foster parents violated their First Amendment free speech and religious freedom rights. Last Thursday, the court ruled unanimously that Philadelphia's treatment of CSS violated the agency's constitutional rights. That majority opinion was authored by Just Chief Justice Roberts and joined by, joined by Justices Barrett, Breyer, Kagan, Kavanaugh, and Sotomayor. So that's six justices total. Barrett also filed a concurring opinion, which was joined by Kavanaugh in fall and Breyer in part, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And then finally, Gorsuch and Alito both authored separate concurring opinions and then joined each other's. So the majority decision, which we'll be talking, we'll be starting with first, is widely seen as a very narrow one uh, with few implications beyond the specific facts of this case. So Gary, let's go to the good, the bad, the ugly in these decisions, but let's, let's start with the good. Is this decision as narrow as everyone is describing it to be and why? Thanks, thanks, Jason. Yes, I, I, I do think this decision is extremely narrow. It might even be arguably narrower than the Masterpiece Cake decision. I think, as we kind of know, Chief Justice Roberts is one who looks for, in some ways, the most minimalist way to resolve big controversies. And he found a way, uh, in this case, to focus on something that I don't think hardly anybody, maybe no one, seriously paid attention to. And that is a provision in the contract that gave the commissioner absolute discretion to grant exemptions from many contractual requirements. And lo and behold, that kind of scenario matches a very old case from almost 60 years ago written by Justice Brennan and one of the key pre-Smith uh, free exercise cases involving unemployment insurance. And, it, and in that particular case called Sherbert, a woman of Seventh-day Adventist uh, said she could not work on Saturdays. So she refused to take a job that would require Saturday work and then apply for unemployment insurance. And she was denied because she was deemed to be available to work. And the US Supreme Court held no, that her religious rights had been violated. And although they didn't make a point of this, but ultimately in 1990, Justice Scalia in the Smith case did, he pointed out that, well, that, that unemployment law said it, you can't get benefits if you are available for work and won't without good cause. And said that that is an administrative across the board discretion to grant a uh, person relief. And they said, if you grant that relief to anyone, you have to give it for religious reasons. And so Chief Justice Roberts found this angle on the case. And as you all may have seen over, over the weekend, there are some people who think that Justice Alito actually was writing the majority opinion here. And ultimately the chief uh, found a way to gather a, a, a majority in support of a very narrow result. Yeah, I mean, I've read that as well, too. Um, and it's quite the majority. I mean, we've got everyone from Sotomayor to Kavanaugh and Barrett on this decision. So how was Roberts able to cobble together this compromise in his decision? Yeah, I, 
I mean, we're never going to know, obviously, whether the people speculating about whether uh, some people are now thinking that Justice Breyer uh, broached this compromise, that there was initially going to be a strong dissent from Justice Sotomayor about harm to the LGBT community, that there was going to be a strong dissent from Justice Kagan about uh, stare decisis and, and sticking with Smith, and that ultimately uh, Breyer made this compromise with uh, the chief that brought Sotomayor and Kagan on board. And then it seems like Justice Barrett was troubled by where Justice Alito was going. And we can talk more about that because that may be how the future hinges here. Yeah, and actually that's um, a great point because one of the things that must have been animating the liberal justices was to avoid the overturning of what we've talked about in the past with the Smith case. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about why that was so particularly concerning, not just for the liberal justices, but also to those of us in the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community. Yeah, and this, I mean, this takes a little bit of context and I don't know how much I can give it, but if everybody kind of understands what happened in 1990 in the Smith case, I mean, again, written by a conservative justice, right? Antonin Scalia dissented to by Blackman and Brennan and Marshall and O'Connor. And what that court said in that decision was essentially, you can't bring a free exercise objection to a neutral, generally applicable law. In that case, you have to swallow the consequences to your religious belief and obey the law. That hadn't been what we thought the law was prior to that time. Prior to that time, we thought that if you were, if your free exercise was substantially burdened in some way, that the government had to show that they had a compelling interest in making you do what it was telling you to do, and they were doing it in the least restrictive way possible. Okay, that was that was the law, and and ultimately. Um, now, that Smith case, if it were to go away, we would theoretically go back to what the law calls strict scrutiny, a compelling interest narrowly enforced, right? And, but the, but the, the interesting thing is, we, we in the law, when we're talking about strict scrutiny, we say it's strict in theory, fatal in fact, but it never was with free exercise. That never happened. I mean, so many free exercise claims pre-Smith were lost. However, when Smith happened, Congress reacted with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and that still applies to federal law particularly. And, and the Supreme Court, like via Justice Alito, have said that means strict scrutiny, and that means strict scrutiny strictly applied getting to very strong religious protective results. So if we get rid of Smith, we aren't necessarily going back to the law pre-Smith, but to Justice Alito's version of strict scrutiny. And it seems like Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh balked that they have concerns about going into that kind of regime. As, as Justice Barrett put it, she says, I'm skeptical about swapping Smith's categorical anti-discrimination approach for an equally categorical strict scrutiny regime. And so that's where we, <laughs> Fulton really left us with the fact that it looks like this court is very much undecided about where it wants to go. I don't think there's any doubt that there are at least five justices who are ready to either eliminate Smith or do something very significant to alter that rule, but they aren't quite sure where they want to go. And that I think is a good thing for us. Yeah, I mean, it does seem as if there's been presented these two very extreme scenarios of preserving Smith or going to strict scrutiny and Barrett seems to be a little indecisive and in the middle and looking for some nuance. But, but before we get to um, Barrett's concurrence and also I definitely want to get to Alito's dissent, I mean, con uh, his concurrence as well too. Um, 
before we leave the majority opinion, I just want to read this one quote that Chief Justice wrote. Um, he wrote in his decision, we do not doubt that this interest in, and I'm adding this in, in LGBTQ non-discrimination is a weighty one for, and then this is where he quotes the Masterpiece Cake Shop case from a few years ago, for our society has come to the recognition that gay persons and gay couples cannot be treated as social outcasts or as inferior in dignity and worth. And got six justices again from Sotomayor all the way to Kavanaugh to sign on to the statement. How significant is that? Well, uh, I think, I, I'm hoping that it is extremely significant. And I think it sends, it arguably sends a message to all of us as, as doing our work that the court recognizes that this is an excruciatingly difficult area, that they want to be protective of LGBTQ rights, they want to be re protective of religious liberty, and they're not sure where to draw those lines. But, but I think like Chief Justice Roberts is very sure where several of his colleagues would draw the line and he would rather not go there. And I think this is, in a way, one, one piece we could follow here is that this is a message to all of us out in the country to try to find a non-judicial way to resolve our differences. Because he's, he's kind of like fending off the tide and, and they pulled it off again. They pulled it together a group of, you know, you, you can imagine, I, it, it must have been a little bitter for Sotomayor to sign on to this opinion. I don't think that's where her heart is, you know, and I would say probably the same for Justice Kagan. And yet they, they, and if this is right, they did it because they are seeing, they were offered an exit ramp to, to avoid doing something that would ultimately hurt either side in some fundamental way. The law is too blunt an instrument here. And I think we, we get one message from this is folks try to find a way to resolve your differences. <laughs> you know. Um, and I definitely want to get to what does the path forward look like. But before we leave the decision, you mentioned Kagan, you mentioned Sotomayor and the challenges we imagine they might have had in signing on to the decision, but they ultimately did so to kind of thwart off Alito's vision of what free exercise should look like. Um, what about Breyer? He signed on to um, Barrett's um, concurrence, but only but refused to sign on to the first paragraph of that. Um, what does that tell you? Well, you know, Justice Breyer, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. Justice Breyer, I believe, has has never been happy with Smith. You know, he wasn't on the. No, I can't remember. He 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 might have been on the court. No, he was not. But he uh, he's not. He's indicated that he's not happy with Smith. So I think Breyer is a vote to um, to either do away with Smith or or to massage it in some different way. <clears throat> and so I think that's why he signed on here. In the first paragraph, uh, Justice Barrett was talking about her views on originalism and the First Amendment and about uh, how to interpret what whether how to read free exercise clause in relation to exemptions. And I think he didn't want to, he didn't want to uh, reveal his, his views on that and agree with her. Uh, but he clearly is indicating that he's, he agrees with the notion that he doesn't want to accept a categorical strict scrutiny regime. But I think he's indicating that, and that there are a need for nuances. And if, if there's any couple of words you can put around Justice Breyer, one might be, common sense and practical and nuance. And I, I think he would be open to finding some compromise. So before we uh, kind of talk about what the impact of this might be beyond the decision and what the path looks forward, um, I wanted to do want to kind of, you know, talk a little bit about Alito, um, Alito's concurrence. And as you said, Gary, Alito would saw, likely saw this as a vehicle to you know, get rid of Smith entirely and go to a strict scrutiny world where, you know, any law that has some type of impact on religious exercise would, you know, I'd at least be suspect of not struck down. Um, he's got this very colorful paragraph in his decision, which has been quoted quite a bit, if I'll read it out loud. 
this decision might as, might as well be written on the dissolving paper sold in magic shops. The city has been adamant about pressuring CSS to give in, and if the city wants to get around today's decision, it can simply eliminate the never use exemption power. If it does that, then voila, today's decision will vanish and the parties will be back where they started. Is he, tr is he right? Mm, absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts has done his has done a little bit of magic here, and I, I think uh, it isn't uh, Justice Alito actually who demonstrates where the holes are in in just Chief Justice Roberts' reasoning. It's Gorsuch in his concurring opinion who does a pretty good job of explaining why um, what the chief did really can't hold up to scrutiny. I mean, what Justice Alito points out is that the city of Philadelphia can solve these problems uh, with the stroke of a pen. And uh, one of the things we could talk about is whether Philadelphia should do that or not. Uh, I think they, they could. They could clear up this whole problem and exclude Catholic social services again. But there may be reasons to think that they should not do that. And what reasons might that be? Well, uh, you know, I heard one of the lawyers from, or I saw one of the lawyers from the ACLU say, you know, in this, in this world now under Smith, one way you get a, out from under Smith and get strict scrutiny is if you show that a law is not neutral. And one of the ways you show that is by showing that there's targeting of religion, or you show that there's hostility to religion. And I think we all know in Masterpiece Cake, that was the exit ramp that Justice Kennedy took uh, to make that a punt and, and pointed out the, some of the comments made by the people on the Human Rights Commission in Colorado in deciding that case. End of story, uh, Jack Phillips, the baker wins. In this case, uh, the, uh, CSS also had ideas about negative comments that they said showed hostility. The uh, um, Chief Justice wouldn't, wouldn't go there, uh, but it's been, it's, it's a way that people are chipping away at Smith by finding hostility wherever they can find it. And, um, oh, I, um, well, you could make an argument, and this is what the ACLU lawyer was suggesting, that perhaps, you know, Beckett will just come back if Philadelphia does this and say, look, <laughs> they're targeting us. And it's a, it, this is just an evidence of hostility. And, you know, Who's to say that that wouldn't happen? And uh, well, and the other thing is if they do that, have they taken this case into the realm of an actual generally applicable and neutral law such that the question of Smith's viability is front and center and has to be decided? And that's a risky proposition at the moment. Yeah, and we'll end this program with talking about what are the cases coming down the pipeline that could present centrally the question of whether or not Smith remains good law. Uh, but before we get there, I wanted to just talk about kind of the impact for the LGBT community. Now, like you said, and as Alito wrote in his concurrence, Philadelphia can remove this exception um, and then you know, claim that this is generally neutral, neutral and applicable and that could possibly withstand constitutional muster going forward. Um, we know this is so much more than a matter of equal treatment though. It's also about life-saving and life-changing services that some of the most vulnerable folks in our community rely on. And this is homeless shelters and food pantries, et cetera, many of which are provided by religiously affiliated social service organizations contracted through their local and state governments. And I know, I mean, with GLAD, we've been working um, very deeply in the last few years um, to uh, help our Department of Children and Families in Massachusetts ensure better treatment for LGBTQ youth. And that's everything from providing services to increase family acceptance, collecting information, SOGI information about the youth in our systems, um, training um, culturally affirming staff, um, making sure LGBTQ youth, who we haven't even spoken about yet in this whole context, um, are put in affirming placements. Um, so uh, there's the equality principle, but there's also just the fact that a lot of people's lives 
uh, depend on receiving these services in a safe and affirming way. Um, what does this decision mean for those other services across the country? Um, is it the case that a lot of these other um, government contracts include these types of exceptions? What does it mean for non-discrimination state statutes? Do they also include these types of exceptions that would then make them subject uh, to this decision? Well, it's hard to speak on the first point because when we talk about these individual contracts, we would have to see what the language is in any of them. I mean, I, I, I think let's start more broadly with state anti-discrimination laws or um, municipal ordinances. I would say it would be surprising to find this type of uh, discretionary exemption available in any of those places. So in that sense, I, I, I don't think this decision does anything. Could there be a similar type of, of uh, discretionary exemption in a, other contracts that governmental entities enter into? I'm, I guess that's possible. I mean, it may be good for all of them to take a look at their contracts <laughs> and clean them up if, if they do, if they're so inclined. But by, by, and, by and large, I would, I would say that, you know, despite the fact that this is an un, unhappy result, that, that the ground has not shifted in any way. You know, non-discrimination principles are enforceable in support of LGBT people that really the same today as they were a week ago, uh, you know, barring, barring something with, that brings another uh, circumstance into the precisely same contractual language as was found here. Thank you for that. So let's talk about what's next. Um, what's coming down the pipelines? What should we be looking out for um, in terms of cases that the opposition has ginned up to advance? What is their ultimate goal of overturning Smith and you know mm -hmm. striking down laws that are neutral and generally applicable, but burden religious exercise in some ways? Well, I mean, think about uh, two, of, two of the huge litigate, well, maybe one of them isn't huge, but two of the litigating arms are Alliance Defending Freedom, which we call ADF, and the Beckett Fund, which was counsel for Catholic Social Services here. When the Supreme Court, as you know, petitions get filed for certiorari, if they rise to the level they get, they get put on the a calendar for the court's conferences, and then we can all watch that uh, in real time. And back in February of 2020, there were at least three cases sitting there before the court for discussion at that conference. And one of them was Fulton. One of them was Arlene's Flowers, which is just like Masterpiece Cake, only with a florist who refused to provide flowers for a same-sex couple's wedding saying it would compel her to speak in support of same-sex marriages. And then there was a case called Ricks versus Idaho in which a fellow who is a contractor and in Idaho, you need a license to be in the business of being a contractor and his religious beliefs do not allow him to provide his social security number to the government and Idaho requires that you provide your social security number. And so he's been, for the last seven years, been without a license. Uh, and he has a claim, which is a pure Smith claim, I think. It has other, it has other nuances, but there's no hostility. It's totally generally applicable. You know, it seems to raise Smith square on. Now, once the court took Fulton, in February of 2020, those other two cases went into limbo and they've been sitting, those petitions have been sitting at the court ever since because generally what the court does is they think, well, we're gonna decide Fulton. And then what we do is we take these other cases with similar issues and we, what they call GVR, grant, vacate and remand, they, they take those cases and immediately send them back to the lower court and say, take another look in light of Fulton. <clears throat> well, that's unlikely to happen here because there's nothing in Fulton to apply to these other cases. At least it would be really odd if they GVR these two cases. 
at the same time, they usually, they come to the end of the term, which is coming probably at least by June 30th, they do what they call a cleanup conference at the court. And then they kind of wrap up all these loose ends that have been hanging around. So, you know, you might think that the odds are that they're just going to deny cert in those two cases, because generally when the court grapples with an issue, and as Alito said here, 2,500 pages of briefing and seven months of discussion, and we've got a whiff of a decision. Kind of true, right? But it doesn't really suggest they're going to want to jump back into this same boat immediately for the next term. Well, so what are they going to do? Friday, not 24 hours after Fulton was decided, both ADF and Beckett filed supplemental briefs in these two cases, essentially to say, don't let us go, hold on to us. You know, Rick says, we're a perfect case for you to take. You know, so th they're trying very hard to fend off or to try to get the court to latch on to Smith again next term. You know, like I wouldn't bet on it, but who knows? And then you all probably saw that the, the Jack Phillips, the baker in Masterpiece Cake has been sued again by a transgender woman for a cake that he refused to make. And the court in Colorado, the trial court in Colorado just ruled in favor of the plaintiff and against Masterpiece Cake. And there's a lot of people saying, here it is. Here's the next vehicle going up. Colorado's law, is general, looks like it's neutral and generally applicable. The hostility piece that worked in the first masterpiece cake isn't there. So, you know, and they're going up. ADF is not going to just, they're not going to stop. They're going to take this as far as they can. So that may be at the Supreme Court in two years, maybe. Um, so the, the and, I'm, and I'm sure there are plenty of other cases in the lower courts that are brewing with issues that can percolate easily to the Supreme Court. So lots of opportunities coming forward for the um, our religious opposition to still overturn Smith and, you know, which would really question all non-discrimination laws in our country, um, including if and when we pass the Equality Act. Uh, I, you know, this is one of our movements and GLAD's top priorities um, is to pass the Equality Act, which would um, uh, add sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination protections to um, our federal non-discrimination statutes um, and protect folks in housing and public services and credit and uh, health care. Uh, so really important priority and subject to the Constitution, just like any other law in our, in our country. And so, you know, it would be subject to the same religious exemptions uh, that a Supreme Court could carve out. Um, under a free exercise, similar to the, the contractual non-discrimination provisions in the Philadelphia contract. Um, so um, the this warning from Roberts about, you know, is there, you know, him, you, you mentioned Gary earlier about, you know, holding off the tide and trying to, you know, send a message to, you know, both sides in this um, um, in this debate to try to find some compromise solution. Um, how, what are your feelings about about those that um, advice from Roberts in this context, and how does this? How do you see this all getting resolved? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I do. I, I do think one of the things to take from this is, and 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 of course, you know, it's fleeting. It could be fleeting, but I think people are starting to talk about not a six-three court, but a three-three-three court. And now we're going to get some important decisions in the next week. Uh, that may tell us there are way there are certain issues on which this is is a six three court, and we've certainly got some big issues coming up next year around abortion, probably affirmative action around the Second Amendment, and you know who knows where this court is going. But I think Fulton and the and the Affordable Care Act uh, decision last Thursday as well are signs that we probably do ourselves harm by pigeonholing the justices in particular places. And, you know, the discussion that this is a, a 6-3 conservative court where we can't possibly win. I think Fulton showed us and the ACA showed us that that's, that's too simplistic. You know, that there, there, 
there, these justices think for themselves. Uh, so many things influence them as they try to read the law and the mood of the American public. Um, so I, 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 I guess I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist at heart, but I, I take heart from the decision last Thursday, even though it's a bummer to lose. It's, it certainly doesn't seem to me to be the right decision. But at the same time, I, I think the court signaled to us that, you know, that they're not ready. They're certainly not inclined to, what, what's the right word, dump on the LGBTQ community. They're looking for solutions to this and we have to find a way to help them. Well, thank you for those words of optimism, Gary. And I always hold on to the, you know, change in public opinion and, you know, greater support and inclusion for LGBTQ folks as, as another source of hope for me. Um, you know, talking again about the Quality Act, we know from polling that over 70% of Americans support non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ folks. And that cuts across um, political lines, that cuts across religious lines. Um, it's a universal value. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, our opposition latching on to, you know, uh, more polarizing, polarizing issues such as religious exemptions or trans inclusion in sports or, you know, whatever else, you know, uh, fear of the day they've, they've created is because they know that if they are arguing against fairness and inequality that they lose. And so that is a sign for me of hope as well, too.